Hey, this is in your best interest. I am Philip Müller. Today, I'm joined by Eric Anziani. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Crypto.com. In this episode, we talk about cryptocurrencies, a topic that garners a lot of debate among investors. We covered the emergence of cryptocurrencies, the regulatory landscape, the pros and cons of using cryptocurrency as an asset class, and much more. I hope you enjoy it, and if you do, be sure to subscribe and consider leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends. Welcome to another episode of In Your Best Interest, your personal finance podcast. I'm your host, Philip Müller, and today we will be chatting about all things cryptocurrencies. It's a topic that always seems to generate a lot of debate in the investment community with people tending to either fully support it uh, and be big supporters of it or being harshly against it. So I think it's quite a polarizing topic uh, that we want to explore in more depth today. And something I personally want to learn a lot more about my, for myself, because I do have some experience with it, but it's still very limited compared to our guest on the show today. And for this topic, I have invited to the show Eric Anziani. Eric is currently the Chief Operating Officer at Crypto.com. Crypto.com's mission is to put cryptocurrency in everyone's wallet. Uh, he currently looks after several functions at Crypto.com, including product, growth, institutional sales, strategy, partnerships, blockchain, research, and data. Eric is also a seasoned tech leader with 14 years of experience in strategy, partnerships, and innovation in both financial services as well as payments, fintech, and lifestyle tech. Before he joined Crypto.com, Eric worked at leading global companies such as Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, PayPal, as well as the Global Fashion Group in countries such as London, uh, cities in London, Paris, Singapore, as well as Tokyo. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today, Eric. I'm really looking forward to discussing the world of cryptocurrencies with you. And as you might imagine, I have about a million and one questions for you. Uh, but before we dive uh, more into the topic itself, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce you a bit more to our audience. I know I just read off a lot of uh, great achievements and a lot of uh, your past before. But how about um, we, we take it a step back and go into your earlier childhood first. And maybe you can share with us a little bit more about, you know, kind of where you grew up, maybe where you went to university, etc. Sure. Hi, hi, Philip. Thanks a lot for having me uh, on the podcast. I'm very excited to, to see how I can share more about the space we're in and, and crypto.com. All right. Um, yeah, where did I grow up? So I'm, I'm a French a citizen. I was born and raised in France. I, started, I did my first studies there uh, in Paris. And uh, later, I did uh, an MBA in Singapore. And after that, I moved to Asia and I've been there for a little bit more than eight years now. Um, was Asia, I was, yeah, was Asia always on your on your list to come to, or was it a coincidence that you with the MBA program, or was it always something you kind of like looked at uh, at conquering at some point? I, I always had a, a keen interest about China's histories and, and culture. Even when I was back in uh, in Europe in my early uh, working days, I started and founded a think tank about China called the China Institute. So I was doing already a lot of travel, uh, reading books, meeting people about China. So that was a Something I was quite keen on, and of course the, the Chinese word, which much, much you know bigger than, than China itself. So I was quite keen to go into the region. Singapore was a a very uh, convenient entry point into into the region with the MBA, and I I really enjoyed my time there. So I ended up staying there almost seven years. Oh wow, yeah, no, it's I think it, it it happens to a lot of people once they once they come over, a lot of them stay, right? Because it is a very vibrant and you know energetic place. I think especially. I feel the same way, uh, having lived for almost 10 years in the US and before always, uh, like you growing up in Europe, this feels, the, the pace of life is, feels uh, very vibrant and positive looking into the future, right? Yeah, that, that is correct. I think uh, especially at the time where I was moving, I think Europe was a lot about cost cutting and you know economic challenges and low growth. And Asia was, and it's still in many parts of the world, you know, apart from this challenging year, all about growth, business opportunities. So that was a very different uh, business and personal environment. It was very exciting. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you there. When when we look back before the MBA, though, is there uh, what did you study in your undergrads uh, over in Europe? Uh, was it also finance or or business or completely different? I'm actually an electrical engineer, although okay. I haven't practiced that skill too much apart from from homeworks. Uh, um, <laughs> 
but yeah, I, I went to an engineer school back in France. So those training usually are quite broad. It, it covers general management processes and even computer science to a certain degree. So I, I did that in, in Paris and then started my uh, career at Goldman Sachs uh, in the capital market side of, of the business. So never really went into the electrical engineering side to, to start with. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> no, that, that's good. That's good. I think, um, you know, I think, and then the combo with the, an MBA, but the engineering, you know, background and brains for it, I think make a very good combo. And you see that quite a lot, right? For people, you know, going, going that way after all. But let's, let's go um, to a moment. You said, you know, right after, uh, you know, studying electrical engineering, um, you started at Goldman Sachs. Was that? really your first uh, look into finance or was there any other experience maybe uh, you know growing up that you you know had some exposure to the finance sector or maybe you even maybe you started investing even before joining Goldman Sachs what was that affinity you had with finance itself it's a, it's a very good question I think um, started probably when I was young and I had quite the, the I was lucky that my parents started giving me pocket money very very small amounts but kind of teaching me what it is to have a bit of money, how to save it, how to, to grow it for special occasions or specific goals. So early on, I had this kind of aspect on how to, to manage and, and build a little bit of wealth, although it was like a couple of euros back in the days. And so that was kind of the first experience. But of course, the, the world of finance is, is much broader and very exciting. It's what's powering the, the economy and you know generating employment and facilitating uh, the growth of businesses. So from, from that perspective, of course, it was, I was very excited to, to join the space and learn more. Yeah, so, but, and I, I think you, you alluded to a good thing. I think, you know, even with pocket money, I think that's where it started for most, most people to learn how to budget, right? Uh, to, to, you know, right. set some money aside for maybe you want to, you know, wanna, you want to buy yourself some kind of toy, but it's very expensive. So it takes maybe a year or two to save up for, right? So I think instilling this at a young age, I think it really sets people up for success in the future. And I always mention this a lot during our personal finance uh, workshops that we do for clients and, and the public. So yeah, no, I think that's, that's, uh, that's good to hear that you had this as well. So then uh, let's move on. Then you get, you go, you get to Goldman Sachs, you get your first, you know, real paycheck after college, anything in particular you remember buying with that first paycheck? Well, that is a long time ago. Let, let me think about it. I mean, in general, I've always been a lot about experiences. So I probably have spent it, uh, you know, with, with loved ones uh, at a dinner or something that, you know, an experience I can share uh, with others. So that's probably, you know, what I would have done if I remember correctly. Yeah, no, and probably uh, you, you were working a lot of hours, as I can imagine from my friends who also joined Goldman Sachs out of college. So um, which, which, which gives you forced savings as well, right? If you're working uh, long hours. No, for sure. <laughs> good, good. And then before we get into crypto, I had one more question more on the personal side. But um, mm -hmm. what would you say was the best investment you've ever made? It doesn't have to be yeah. a financial investment if you if, if that's not what it was, right? It can be anything. Yeah, and, and actually, I'm thinking along those lines. I think, I mean, from a professional standpoint, trying out new things, investing in yourself, trying to learn as many things as you can, I think is is the best investment you can do. I mean, you know, just looking at cryptocurrency in particular, uh, as well. I was um, you know working for an e-commerce business that uh, I really started investing some time outside of work. Just to learn about it and start practicing it, uh, you know, investing, you know, moving money around, reading about the technology itself. And six, 12 months down the road, I, I joined crypto.com. It was great, great opportunity for me. So I yeah. think investing in yourself and trying new things, continuous learning, I think is is the best investment you can do from, I would say, from a professional standpoint. But also if I look at a you know personal standpoint, it's also important to you know spend as much time as you can with your loved ones. Uh, you know, time flies by, and I, I think it's also a, a worthwhile uh, investment. No, absolutely, I, I I agree with you on both. Actually, you know, I I tried I try to also you know tell people, especially we, we, you, I have always interns working with me as well, and you know they come they're young, and I said, hey, look, you try to learn as much as possible while you're here. But, you know, go try different different things, right? You never know where life takes you. And I think uh, uh, that's uh, that's really important. And and become, you know, I, I like to, to say that if you become obsessed about something and you can learn as much as you can about it, especially with the internet, right? Giving you so much access, you can really, you know, find, 
find your way in life uh, through that. So thanks, Eric, for sharing your story there. That's uh, super, super interesting for the audience, I think. So you already started talking about it a little bit. I do want to switch gears and we go to today's episode's topic, which is cryptocurrencies. And I think the first time I had heard about crypto was not so early from when it was started, but it wasn't about probably 2014. Um, I never really followed it much then, but I, I but I heard it, uh, you know, just through some clients. I had clients down in the Bay Area and some of them were playing around with it, but I kind of like brushed it off and said, okay, well, uh, nothing for me to to do there. But then I was living with my wife in India for, we lived there for two years, um, 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. And after the crackdown, the demonetization of the rupee notes there, I really paid attention to it because people around me, like, you know, friends I made uh, in India there, everyone was kind of like worried about that demonetization and people started to get more and more interested in cryptocurrency. And obviously I moved to Singapore in the summer of 2017 and then, you know, we had that big run up in, 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 in crypto. And when my dad started calling me from Germany and asked how he would, how he's able to buy Bitcoin, I knew there was something going on. Right. So, uh, I think a lot of people had this experience, but my dad is 60 plus years old and he doesn't even invest in the stock market. Right. So when he was uh, calling me and said, Oh, how can I open an account? Do you know how it works? Uh, I, I started paying more attention to it. And obviously, being in Singapore and being in the fintech scene, there, there, there is a lot of um, a lot of that here in Singapore, right? Uh, which you can attest to by having lived here. So what I wanted to do is for the audience to 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 get a better understanding. How about we take them back a little bit mm -hmm. in time, and maybe you can tell us more about the history of cryptocurrencies. And then we can kind of move that conversation on from there. It doesn't have to be, I know it's a long history, but at least give a small overview so that people can understand it a bit better. Of course. I think if I look at uh, say digital currency more, more broadly, I think it really emerged, let's say, in the early 80s. And there was precursors like eCash or DigiCash that came out to the market. But it's really until late 2008 that we had a our first true decentralized cryptocurrency, which was Bitcoin, that people are quite familiar with. And this was really a revolutionary peer-to-peer -peer cash system that uh, paved the way, I would say, for the entire category. And then following that, uh, quite a few years after that, we had all those exciting protocols that were built like Ethereum or Litecoin or even you know the crypto.com chain as well. So. I would say, you know, that's kind of the genesis and what cryptocurrency is really is enabling movement of value over the internet uh, without having any central authority that approves or validate things. It's fully decentralized. And this is this big ledger that is there. It's a public ledger where all the transactions are recorded that you cannot alter and uh, that is visible for everyone to see. And so it's a very fascinating in invention and I, I recommend anyone to, to go and read the the Bitcoin white paper uh, that was published um, in late uh, 2008 and uh, that explains a bit uh, how, how the blockchain works. And it's really fascinating. On top of the tech, it's also the incentive mechanism to make sure, uh, although we don't have a central authority to validate that this is a valid transaction, there are the right incentives in place. So there's a bit of game theory there to make sure all the actors participating in the network uh, behave properly and ensure, you know, when a transaction is, the value is moved, it's the correct amount, you actually have the amount and there's no things like double spending and, and this kind of bad behavior. So that's fascinating. It is a super fascinating topic, right? And again, I, I mentioned in the beginning, it's a, it's a quite a polarizing topic too, right? You have a lot of people, I think it's it's getting getting more to the fact that I think in the beginning, people were saying it's, oh, it's just this bubble, you know, it just going to go and pass away. The governments will crack down on this, right? Um, because it's decentralized. They want it obviously under their control, these kind of uh, things. But now, you know, 11, 11, 12 years onwards, it's still here, right? And it seems it's here to stay. Um, Definitely. I think we've, we've matured, I would say, from the experiment stage. And it is now an important technology trend that is here to stay. I, I would agree with that statement. Yeah. So, so, so with that being said, you know, it's a technology, but it's also seen as an investment, right? So mm -hmm. how, you know, what makes cryptocurrencies an interesting investment vehicle in, in, in your opinion? 
Sure. Some of the cryptocurrencies are stores of value. So they, they do maintain a certain value throughout time. Also, they provide certain form of decorrelation with traditional assets. So not all and not necessarily all the time, but in general, uh, they have a, a strong decorrelation versus stocks or some of the traditional products. And having some of those in your portfolio can actually reduce your risk overall, uh, your portfolio risk. So it's we've seen a lot of uh, whether it's retail investors or hedge funds or even family offices starting to get you know one, two, three, up to five percent of the allocation in this those digital assets due to that decorrelation aspect. And then I would say it's still an early stage asset class, and the usage is still relatively limited. So there's high growth potential, uh, definitely in terms of more people learning about it and, and investing into it. No, and, and I was actually going to go to that uh, allocation uh, question later. What do you think is your oh. ideal asset allocation? But we will get to that later. But you kind of alluded already what some of the bigger institutional players are doing. So that's that's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that very important point, uh, but it's not relevant to you know all all retail users necessarily. But is the fact that because there's no central authority, it is what we call censorship resistant. So you know you have full control over those assets. And even if there's a, someone who really want to, you know, a bad actor, a central actor that want to take your funds out, they can't do it. It's yours. Uh, so having that form of control, especially in countries where maybe government don't have a, a great of a track record or other actors that have you know, control over your, your assets and, and your properties, it is a, a safe haven in that sense to have those stores of value like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency in a protocol that you have control over and, and that is not you know, at the mercy of, of the very few. No, and I think that, that that's an, an interest. All of those were really interesting points that I want to get a little bit deeper in. Um, the first one you talked about, uh, you know, low correlation to some of the traditional asset classes, right? And uh, even in, in the space of cryptocurrencies, there's also different ones that you can choose from. It's not just Bitcoin, which most mm -hmm. people know, right? So what would you say, uh, like the pros and cons of crypto in relation to traditional currencies. And then we can also look at it as a, because you mentioned store of value. So a lot of people, when they think of store of value, they think of gold, right? Which traditionally, you know, has been used in portfolios to be that, that pillar. And again, also we can look at crypto in relation to other alternative coins, because if you, you know, if you go on any kind of website or, you know, coin market cap, you see hundreds or thousands of coins, right? So so there's so many. So um, how about we start with just the pros and cons in terms of, in relation to traditional currencies? Well, what is your opinion there? Sure. Uh, I mean, if we look at the at the pros, maybe overlap a li little bit with the, the yeah. previous question, but maybe I'll, I'll start with something which is around mobility. It's very easy to move money around across borders with, with uh, cryptocurrency. Some are faster than others. Um, so you look at Bitcoin, it will take maybe an hour to have Bitcoin transferred to another address uh, across the globe, which if you compare to uh, traditional banking, and you know it may take two to three up to five days sometimes. So it's still much better, uh, but you have also currencies that do it in seconds. So in general, having the ability to move money around in a very secure and, and, and fast way across the globe is a very strong value proposition that cryptocurrency offer that traditional currency don't. I think versus, this could be a really yeah. good one for the future too, in payments, right, and everything, right? The 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 instant, the instantaneous thing. Because I think this still, especially for me as a foreigner in Singapore, you know, and you know, having to move money sometimes around between my you know U.S. accounts and Europe accounts, and everything taking forever, right? Um, and sometimes you don't even know where the money is for days because it's. Right. Yeah, and you're it, always it, it worried it about stressful. it, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it becomes every time I know now by now how it works. But hey, if it's an if you're paying someone and it's an account that you've never transferred money to before, it, it's 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 it is quite uh, stressful for a few days. <laughs> True, I think if uh, we compare also to to stocks and bonds and things like that, the the difference in the uh, with having cryptocurrencies, the, so the liquidity, uh, those are assets that you can liquidate instantly and use. Maybe the depth of the liquidity is not yet, of course, to, to the level of the stock market, but being able to use those in the real world instantly is a very strong value proposition that you can't really do today with, with stock or, or bonds. And so that form of liquidity and realization of the value and usage in the real world is something that cryptocurrency uh, offers today. Yeah, so, so, so 
that that's towards the currencies and also stocks and bonds, right? So how how do you see cryptocurrency compare to gold, right? Because I think this is hmm. the one where the most comparisons always been made, right? Where, where do you see it in relation to gold? Yeah, I think both are, are stores uh, of, of value, in some cases, medium of exchange. But to be able to use gold as a medium of exchange is, is extremely troublesome. And I think that the great advantage of, of cryptocurrency is that, you know, you just need an internet connection and a wallet and you can transfer it everywhere across the globe. Unfortunately, you can't do that with gold. Plus, gold can be seized as well, which is not the case for cryptocurrency. So, and we've seen it in the past, I think, you know, in, in countries where that were impacted by hyperinflation, like Venezuela, for example. A lot of people try to move some of their assets in gold and try to flee the country, but their gold was seized as they tried to leave the country. And you, you can't do that for cryptocurrency. And that censorship resistant and the control you have over it is quite unique uh, and I think serve a purpose as well. Yeah, and I, I, I think you alluded it to it during the gold discussion we just had now, as well as during the, um, when we talked about currencies, as well as uh, stocks and bonds, right? The decentralization factor. Do you think it's only a pro or does it also have some cons? Because, you know, uh, you know, if you don't have any kind of oversight from the government or, you know, like you don't have anyone overlooking the space, there could potentially also be a lot of fraud, right? Which, you know, in a more in a market with you know stocks and bonds you know you have the regulators the sec in the us uh, you know mas here in singapore etc how, how do you see that evolve over time because i think this is also something that a lot of the retail investors or like my dad would probably question right because they they want some kind of they feel like the government is their safety mechanism sometimes right uh, how, how do you see that it's fair and and you know when you you get more control you, you have also more responsibilities and including you know being able to do your own research and understand uh, the risk uh, which which it can be harder for for you know everybody so wh what i would say here is the space in general especially at, at its con when it connects to the traditional world will be regulated and i think that's needed especially when you're touching traditional money or traditional rails like like visa or mastercard and you connect them with this new world of of cryptocurrency it is happening across the globe. Singapore is quite at the forefront uh, on that topic. I think the, the MAS has put a very uh, thought through framework to start regulating and providing guidance on you know, digital asset businesses. Uh, so at, at the same time to kind of let the innovation happen, but protect uh, the, the citizens uh, of Singapore. So that, that is happening. And I think we're, as a company, you know, go back to crypto.com, or, you know, compliance is one of our first uh, values with, with security. And, you know, as we connect to traditional world, it is very important that we apply the right mechanism there to, to protect the, the parties involved. So that part is happening, but within the, the cryptocurrency environment, you know, movement of funds and things like that should be uh, able to move in a privacy protected way and, and relatively freely. Uh, otherwise, the, this whole experiment does not bring much value uh, to users, we could continue using the traditional way. Correct. Otherwise, you just make it the traditional way, right? So, no, yeah. no, agree with that. Thanks, thanks for that explanation. So, be before we move on to the asset allocation uh, question, I have: How do you see when, when, when? Let's say you you got me. I I would like to you know get some exposure to to the cryptocurrency space. So which one should I invest in, right? Because there's so many, you know, different uh, different coins, and there, obviously there's Bitcoin, Ethereum. Then you have smaller ones. In in terms of correlation between the different coins, and then also, you know, looking uh, just at Bitcoin because it's the biggest one. Where do you see people should uh, you know start with first? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think when I, I see, you know, people entering the space, I, I would always recommend if they want to start their journey, you know, investing. And of course, this is not an investment advice disclaimer. Correct. But no, I, no. I, and I, I will make this, we make this quite clear. We have, we have something written as well. So yes, no <laughs> investment advice. This is just us getting personal some opinions. No. Correct. Personal opinions. I, I, I recommend people to start with Bitcoin because it's the oldest one. That's the one that's, uh, you know, one of the most secure out there uh, and has a very interesting, you know, money supply and, and utility that people, not only in the retail space, but also in, in the institutional space value and start small and start probably with funds that you, if you were to, you know, lose 10, 20, 30 percent uh, of value on, you will not be too uh, impacted financially. And for sure, do not borrow 
to invest. Uh, yes, we <laughs> always make this very clear in anything. That's <laughs> that's the worst, right? <laughs> Correct. So I think it's it's good to start with something that you know is familiar, has been there for a long time. Also, move money around, try a bit, feel what what the blockchain is about, uh, how does it work, uh, yeah, and then you know start reading about the space. I think that's that's a good start. And and then second. Depending on the platform that you choose to work with, there may be uh, specific tokens that have utility uh, on that platform. Uh, and I think it's usually utility token is probably the next step for investors, especially on the retail side, to actually get value uh, and utility out of their investment, not from a pure speculative standpoint, but actually rewards, benefits, access to specific products. So if you look at, uh, for example, the, the CRO token, which is you know the crypto.com chain token, if you are to buy some of it and you stake it, so you deposit it for a certain period of time, then you get discounts on, on events, uh, you get reduced fees when you trade uh, on, the, on the exchange platform or when you pay your friends or when you buy at a merchant online. So it, it gives you benefits. And there's a few reputable you know, utility tokens out there that have proven to, to deliver value on top of the potential speculative value that, that they may have. Yeah, and I think you alluded to a couple of nice points there. And because one of my the next things I want to talk about is how do people actually get access to crypto? Because I think this is also one of the it's getting better. And I you guys you, I think you guys do an amazing job, right? And you can you know explain that a little bit better of how you guys help people get access to it. But I feel like this is still one of the areas in the cryptocurrency space that is quite it's not it's not necessarily difficult. But people are afraid of it when you, first, especially if you don't have any kind of technical knowledge, right? You know, uh, you go to an exchange, you hear all the news about, you know, exchange uh, exchanges. Your money is not safe there. You should move it to a to a hardware wallet. Then you you maybe you get go one step further. You buy a hardware wallet, and now it becomes really complicated to a lot of people, right? So it's not people like us who are in the fintech space, but uh, for my parents, right, or friends who have nothing to do with technology in, in their day-to-day -day job, I think for them, it feels like overwhelming, right, to buy and then move the money around. Maybe if you send it, if you if you forget one one piece of the, the wallet address, it's gone forever, right? So it makes it very, like, feel like overwhelming. So could you maybe allude a little bit to 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 that? Like how 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 do you, how do people get access, our listeners, to crypto in a more easy way, or what's the safeguards that they should at least have in place, right? To because it's it's their money, right? So they hold value, and you want to be sure that they're safe. Definitely, I mean, and you're you're right on point. I think as we give more control for individuals, especially around their their money. This comes with great responsibility and managing your own security uh, of your funds is not easy. And, and until t today, it, it is still not trivial. And that's probably why I, I don't recommend for people who are just starting in their journey to managing fully their assets in terms of security, because it's quite challenging. And I think it, they can do it progressively. So first, usually the first step is good to go on a platform that kind of help you manage that. Of course, you have counterparty risk. But it's a good introduction to the space and you don't need to put too big of an investment there as you get more familiar to it. It's what we call custodial platforms. Uh, so basically, they, they are the custodian of your funds. And here, I think you need to look out for a few things. With any platform you put your money in, you still need to do a bit of research, uh, even if they're you know uh, helping you manage the custody and, and simplifying things. You need to look, for example, at the certification that company has uh, in terms of information security, in terms of data privacy, in terms of their ability to manage and control, let's say, credit card information if you use credit card. So th those, I think, certification or even licenses are very fundamental for you as a, as a kind of first check. Also, as it's a new category, do they have any insurance in case something happened? Um, so insurance coverage is something also important to look at. So at crypto.com, we have the, the highest coverage in the industry, up to $360 million of assets that are insured. And so those are the things I think to start with when you look at this kind of platform, then you can check, you know, team profile, their credential, and who, who they work with. Um, you know, if they work, they have global and, and deep partnership with a recognized player in the space like Visa or, or other type of um, you know, serious uh, actor, uh, then it's also a good sign that, that the platform is run properly. Because yeah, those especially because partners, those partners will have done their due diligence as well, right? Yes. And, and also insurers, I think, uh, you know, at Crypto.com, we've gone through that journey and I, I can tell you the level of due diligence that is required for us to, to get some insurance coverage is extremely 
advanced. So you know, those are, are signs that the, the company is investing in, in managing the funds, the processes, the security in the right way. So if you, you've done a bit of due diligence on your side, you can go with a custodial platform maybe first, crypto.com, you can you know, log in in two minutes, you have an account, and then you can buy crypto with three taps and you have your first Bitcoin. So that's very easy to do. But it's important that you do those checks in advance because you know this is money and this is value. No, it is exactly right. And I think that, but, but so for example, you guys and other players, it, it's becoming easier to get uh, your toes into the water of cryptocurrencies, right? So uh, that, that's why I think I, I heard about it in 2014, but it was so difficult and so overwhelming, you know, on to do this on top of your normal day job uh, to then spend significant time. And uh, it, it was very, very, it was very frightening to do the first transaction ever <laughs> on the blockchain, but, but also empowering, right? Because after that, you can kind of like, oh, it's not that bad, right? It's actually a super interesting topic that I like to do uh, a lot of research on myself. Um, so, so thank you for the explanation on how, how it works and kind of the things that the listeners can take away when they do their own due diligence, right, uh, of, of, of um, starting their crypto journey. Um, based on what we just discussed, um, before we go into more some, some of my f future of crypto questions, uh, I, I do want to see if you have an ideal allocation. Let's say, you know, I have an investment portfolio, you know, has stocks, bonds, maybe you own some real estate, uh, you have some cash. What percentage would you say um, is a good way for for an asset allocation to put towards the crypto space? Well, that, that's a tough question. It, it really depends on, on your risk profile as well. But in general, I recommend up to 5% okay. for, for people that are new to the space. And then depending on your, your risk appetite and you know what, what are your goals also that you want to achieve, yep. uh, you can start expanding from there. But I uh, you know, recommend to do it progressively and learn more about the space, stay informed uh, before expanding further. Yeah, and I think I, it's also about time horizon because I, th I think you quickly mentioned it earlier, right? Uh, like put money in that you might be willing to lose on paper at least 20, 30%, right? So I think, you know, in the crypto space, you still have a, it's on Bitcoin, if we just take that, you still have a lot of volatility, right? So yes, uh, does it have, you know, average returns good, but the, the daily volatility or weekly volatility is still quite high, right? So people need to understand that and stomach that. Um, but if they are long term goals, you know, are 10, 20 years away from now, they can they definitely need to take that into account and that way smooth out their returns as well. Right. You're right. Uh, I think the space and uh, the asset class is still nascent and it is growing. It will be volatile for some time and the volatility will, will go down. Uh, later but for it to grow you need volatility and people yes. need to be able to as you say stomach that because sometimes on a daily basis it can be quite quite wide so i think if you have those long-term goals it can help you navigate yeah are there ways already to to kind of because uh, you know at stash away um we always advise people especially with longer term goals to you know kind of like do your monthly deposits towards savings right and you can kind of like dollar cost average into the market um do you guys already offer tools or are there already in the space tools where you can kind of like dollar cost average into the market kind of automatically i think it's a very important feature uh, we're actually working on it uh what we okay. call recurring buy so yep. we'll be bringing that to to the market in the coming months um, I think it's a, it's a nice way to get regular exposure and grow your portfolio while you know mitigating some of the big price movement. Yeah, exactly. You kind of take you, can, you take a little bit of uh, automatically take advantage of because the problem is that you know it's with any kind of investment. It's always if if you wait, it's the market goes up, then you think like, oh, now it's too high. I'm going to hold off on it, right? <laughs> and even though your goal is very far away, and then you wait two weeks and it's higher even than that, right? So when should you have bought? And I think that that, that having that dollar cost averaging into the market is actually a, a nice tool for most people to be disciplined about their long term goals, right? Completely agree. Yeah. So then let's let, thank you all uh, again already for all this information. It's I think it's super, super interesting to the listeners. But uh, to wrap it up, I have a couple of questions and uh, they're more about the future. Right. So we've talked a little bit about the past. We talked about the present and how we get exposure and, you know, you know what the benefits are. But um, there's a few things that are developing now, right? Uh, you hear more and more governments talking about issuing coins. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, 
I wanted to understand um, how initiatives such as like the Chinese government's digital yuan or like a Facebook Libra even impact the outlook of for like Bitcoin, Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. Do you have uh, do you have a view on that? And Yes, those are the two major trends that we're seeing in, in the space in terms of things that will impact adoption globally. And, and I believe in a positive way. Uh, the first one you mentioned is what we call CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. China is leading the way on that front, but there's a, also a lot of government in uh, Europe and also the US is looking into it that are already making good progress, consulting with actors. We actually, as a company, uh, respond to those consultation paper and then provide ideas on how, how those can be built or how can they be distributed to, to retail customers. So this is a really big trend. It is happening in China. It's already being tested in a few provinces. It introduced a notion of digital money or digital currency to users. Uh, it will have some drawbacks and won't be as decentralized as, as cryptocurrency, especially in the first version that they, they, they come out. But people will start being more comfortable with this concept of cashless digital currency and we'll get some exposure to cryptocurrency and we'll see the difference between the two. So I think it's very positive for the space that central banks and government are, are looking into providing those digital currency. And, and I think in terms of the, the difficult times we're facing now with the COVID-19 pandemic, the cashless trend that we're seeing in society is being accelerated. Uh, we want we don't want to be uh, exchanging cash notes today. We still want to retain the value of what, what is cash, and but make it in a digital way. So that is also helping move forward on that front. So that, that's for um, central banks' digital currency. The, the second one you're referring to is, the I would say, corporate or big tech layers starting to participate in, in the cryptocurrency space by offering a cryptocurrency purchase to their users or launching their own cryptocurrency. So that we've we've seen that, for example, for the offer with Square in the US, and they're offering Bitcoin to their users, and then it's it's a great way to get adoption in the space. We are seeing it with with new protocols like Libra by Facebook uh, as a way to bring a, a new set of value that can be exchanged uh, across that platform. And uh, you know, Facebook they have almost three billion you know monthly active users. It's a huge reach, uh, and I think that's great for the space that more people get exposed to technology that are linked to digital currency and close to cryptocurrency. So people get awareness and they start experimenting. And so I think it's overall very positive. Yeah, and I, 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 I do agree with the adoption, right, and everything. But uh, if, if you think about what we talked about earlier, like the decentralization piece of, you know, of Bitcoin being very valuable, now you're putting it into the hands of the government. Isn't that exactly the opposite of, 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 of what was wanted from, from Bitcoin? So I, I see people getting more comfortable with holding it, but will that not have a direct impact on Bitcoin prices or the value of Bitcoin, because if people then trust the government again, right, uh, or Libra, Facebook Libra, because they have the reach, right, like you said, right, they can, people will be super comfortable using the, all the different Facebook channels that they own to, to transact with their currency. And then what is it exchangeable to? Is it exchangeable to the Bitcoin or to dollars, right, uh, fiat currencies? What's your view on that? I actually don't see it as a negative for Bitcoin. It is, okay. it is it is definitely a positive because those CBDCs and the digital currency that are coming up from corporate players or, or other governments uh, don't have the same properties as Bitcoin. And that reinforced the value of Bitcoin being fully decentralized, secure, um, you know, censorship resistant. That is not going away. And actually, uh, in contrast of those other type of digital currencies, I think it, it highlights the value even further of what Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrency out there are offering. And the awareness journey or digital currency is, is progressing well, but the usage is not. So we still need more education from different actors. And even if what they're promoting is not exactly cryptocurrency, it's broader, uh, it's digital currency with slightly different properties. It does educate people about you know digital money. And they can look also at what Bitcoin and other currency can offer and, and see the difference. And so yeah. I, 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 I'm no, 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 I agree with that explanation. That yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, no, I think that's, that's absolutely uh, valid points. And I, I, I appreciate you sharing them because that was something that I was personally uh, 
wondering how you stand with that, right? Because there's a lot of discussion around that topic. So, so thank you for that. And again, um, thank you so much for, for being part of our podcast. We really appreciate it. I think this will has a lot of good educational value to our users uh, and uh, listeners. And I hope, I think we, we can have you on again because I think we could go on and on with other questions that I had written down, but I'm being mindful of our time as well. So to wrap it up, is there any... Um, you know, other than you uh, going on crypto.com for users to 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 learn more, uh, do you have any maybe favorite podcasts or websites that users can get some more information on this topic about? Sure. I mean, we uh, we invest in education a lot. I think because we need to to grow the space, and as you mentioned, sometimes there is a bit of complexity we need to to explain. So we have what we call the crypto.com university, which gives kind of basic introductory articles about. What is blockchain? What is Bitcoin? You know, how to buy your first crypto? Things like that. So I recommend you know your um, audience to go and, and check it out. We also have the crypto.com research, which is a little bit more advanced that goes into uh, more details if you've you've kind of passed that initial stage and you, you want to learn more. I listen to a few podcasts. I I really like the the one by like Laura Shin, um, Unchained and Unconfirmed on the space. But there's quite a lot out there, and it's good to explore and try to see what you can learn from them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, really, again, appreciate it. Thank you for, have, for being on here today. And I'm sure we'll be speaking again in the future. So until then, um, you know, have a good rest of the year. And again, thank you. Thanks, Philippe. That's it for the show this week. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, subscribe and leave us a review. The reviews really help us and we love reading your comments as well. In Your Best Interest is hosted by me, Philip Müller. We're produced by Stashway and we're mixed by Mo Ramley. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the Stashaway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.